session called uh, Workforce of the Future, Degrees, Credentials, and Badges. I'm Mary Gwen Wheeler. I've uh, spent the last decade in Louisville trying to in you know, working with partners to increase uh, post-secondary attainment in our community, recognizing that's just uh, uh, goes hand in hand with economic opportunity. Uh, you know, I've been really excited to listen to some of these uh, sessions. Uh, where this this summit is really helping to normalize what's happening in our economy. It's a sh this shift toward digitiza digitization and automation um, has even been accelerated far beyond we, what we expected by the pandemic. You know, I think we're all using our phones for much more than just texting and calling and social media. We're buying our food, we're shopping from it. Uh, people are working remotely, we're going to school remotely. Um, and this shift though, uh, will put a premium on continued education, higher education, especially bachelor degrees and above in the labor market. But at the same time, it's increased this demand for shorter term and stackable credentials that have this marketable value and in industry certifications. So this session is really uh, going to help share some of the ways that employers and providers are trying to capitalize on these trends uh, to create opportunity. So I'm going to take a little moment to give a little context, and of course, I got to use some data, right? Um, so, in the 2008 Great Recession, we saw that this shift to higher skilled workforce was what happened almost overnight, um, with almost all new jobs that came back after that recession requiring some education or training beyond high school. And now more than half or 56% of good jobs, uh, according to the Georgetown Center on Workforce and Education, require a bachelor's degree or higher. So before in the industrial economy, only about, about two out of three jobs required only a high school diploma or less. Today, two out of three jobs in the post-industrial economy call for some education or training beyond high school. And the need to upskill, as I said, is so much a part of this digital shift. McKinsey Global Institute projects that by 2030, 17 million US workers will need to transition occupations in the post COVID economy. So the reality is that this disruption is likely to affect our younger, less educated and lower wage communities of color the most. Uh, if you look at the data, each year, only about a quarter of all bachelor degrees are awarded to young adults in the bottom half of the income distribution. And bachelor degree attainment for Blacks and Latinx adults trails their white peers by 14 and 21 percent, respectively. Uh, the pandemic's also accelerated growth and proliferation of these short-term industry credentials. Credly, which is a digital credentialing platform, reports that the number of organizations issuing industry and workforce credentials is up 83% since March 2020. And the demand for these shorter term credentials is high. National polling done by the Strata Center on Education, which we've all been looking at closely, uh, on COVID's impact on education behaviors, show that the most popular option for people who are considering, considering education or training are certificates, certifications, or licenses, and specifically those credentials that are gonna help them get a job or a better job. So these trends really surface several important questions which we'll try to answer uh, today. One, how can and how, sh how are employers supporting the skilling and reskilling and upskilling of workers? Which credentials matter? Are there career pathways that can be shaped by these credentials? How do working adults find out about opportunities uh, and to get these credentials? And who's helping them navigate this burgeoning set of options and weighing degrees versus credentials? When do you combine them? When do you invest? How do you find things that are affordable? Uh, and lastly, what can and is being done to ensure that the low income and communities of color who've borne the brunt of the pandemic's impact get full support of these post-secondary opportunities to thrive in this transitioning economy. So I'm really excited to introduce the panel of speakers who I'm going to be able to shut up here and let them really give you the information uh, they know. You're going to hear themes about um, multiple pathways to good jobs and career advancement. Uh, of what an earlier session called Tequity, which is a keen focus on tapping the talent of these underserved communities, themes of access and affordability. Um, and uh, let me start by 
We're going to hear first from Roger Kud, who's Humana's Enterprise VP for Talent Development and Organization, um, and uh, then Dave Christopher, uh, and then last Telly, and then we're going to be opening it up to question and answer. So uh, start thinking that through. Um, and as as Roger said, we welcome uh, an, a lively chat. So uh, we'll try to respond to that. So Roger, um, you've led deep internal research on what skills and credentials lead to career advancement within Humana. You've built an ever-evolving set of educational supports for your employees, as well as investing in building a bench uh, of skilled workers uh, through partnerships with JCPS, General Assembly, and others. Can you talk to us about the importance of degrees, certificates, badges for recruitment and career advancement and retention within Humana and ways that Humana is, is, is in investing in these uh, current and future employees? Sure. Thank you. Thanks, Mary Gwena. Thanks to the other panelists. It's a pleasure to be here, and and then thanks to those who have, who have joined the discussion. And then we will watch the chat, and, and then welcome a lively chat. I will, I'll just leave you with a few uh, kind of key themes or messages. I think that to me that uh, will engender the conversation on the panel. Um, I would say from an employer standpoint, there's a few things. One is uh, degrees and. Not sure. These fire alarm is going off. Um, the um, degrees and in, in, in credentials and in those kinds of things that we've relied on for for decades uh, in in companies uh, will continue to be the case. There are certain uh, professions, positions, and so forth that require licensure, for example, and and those kinds of things uh, will constantly require degrees and, and credentials and so forth. Uh, and, and so there's there's some of that, uh, but I'll tell you, there's a lot of progress that we will make and we are making around skills and around jobs and positions that uh, can, can be thought of differently where we may have just based on tradition or based on the way that we were thinking about jobs and the way jobs get uh, graded in companies and our systems and so forth, uh, may have uh, uh, had degree required. Uh, and and uh, I think that's evolving. That's evolving for us. It's evolving for many companies, uh, and and so as that evolves, what is helping that evolve? And I'll say it's the emphasis on skills and skill development, and and other types of credentials in the ways in certification. So the skills foundation and the way we think about skills and the way we think about competencies and the way we assess those and so forth. Those that's getting more sophisticated, and as that gets more sophisticated, and other partners come into that equation. Uh, like private companies and so forth, um, that'll evolve the way we think about that in terms of what is really the qualification or what are the qualifications necessary to do the job. And and I would say, just to give you an example, just just to personalize it for for maybe many on the on the call here is is that if I were looking at a candidate and a person received a bachelor's degree or even a master's degree. Uh, many years ago, and I didn't see any credential or certification or anything since then, then I would, you know, they probably took internal training if they're part of a larger company and, and so forth, and maybe had community based resources that they went through. But, but it's the lifelong learning piece can contrast that with somebody who may not have had an opportunity to get a degree earlier in their career. And uh, for whatever reason, but then I see this pattern of credentials and constant learning and certifications and this eagerness to to continually update their skills I you know I'll take that second profile uh, in many respects uh, certainly depending on the job but uh, but I would take that uh, one other theme uh, Mary Gwen is, is is time and the development of skills and the development of qualifications is becoming such an increasingly rapid cycle. Um, and again, degrees and learning how to learn and all the goodness that comes from associate's degrees, bachelor's degrees, secondary degrees um, is, is, is essential in, in so forth. But some in some fields in particular, let's talk about digital or analytics, the, the pace of those uh, uh, skills and the pace of those uh, uh, sectors are moving so fast that this more rapid cycle skill development and credentialing uh, actually uh, is is more appropriate for when the when the cycle is turning so fast um, and and you can get that in universities and in, 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 
in junior colleges and others are, are very contemporary, but, but uh, credentialing allows you to do that. Um, maybe I would say one more thing, and then I'll be quiet, and I can just add some things later on. Is, uh, uh, and maybe two thoughts, actually. Uh, one is that the, the technology tools are, get, are changing rapidly so that the quote-unquote hurdle to entry or the barrier to entry in those tools is becoming less. So credentials and other kinds of certifications are certainly sufficient. And I'll just, uh, I know Microsoft's a big part of this conference. Uh, the tools and the suites that Microsoft is developing is allowing people access to um, application development and analytics and other kinds of things that often took a few years of post-secondary education to to develop some skills and qualifications for the tools are becoming easier. So that barrier and that hurdle to get to uh, the knowledge and skills necessary to use the tools is becoming much easier. And, and the last thing I would say is just cost. Um, you know, credentials and, and degrees and so forth, the cost of those is becoming much uh, more variable so that uh, if I can only afford to get a credential now and, and I want to continue to do that, I can the cost barrier, I think, is becoming uh, more attractive as well and becoming easier for, for individuals to build skills and demonstrate that they've done those through a credential or, or a degree and so forth. But, uh, but the cost, uh, I think, is when you look at the full spectrum, I think it's giving uh, individuals more options. Roger, just to finish before I, I, I move on to Dave, it, you had mentioned uh, also, and can you share with the, how, that there's some percentage of jobs that you've now mapped to skills and that you're using um, in the uh, recruitment as well, that you've taken off yeah. uh, degrees and put skills and competencies in instead, something yeah. like that. Yeah, we've got more work to do on that, certainly, because we're on the journey. But we've mapped, even as of this morning, we've mapped 90% plus of our positions to skills. Mm -hmm. And uh, more work to be done around the degree requirements and things like that. So, uh, so we're not by necessarily by all means any means done. Uh, but that's the journey that we're on, both from a recruiting standpoint, Mary Gwen, but also from an internal mobility mm -hmm. and career pathing and helping people understand how to match skills to jobs. Mm -hmm. And and it's making it easier for for individuals to kind of self-design career paths. Uh, because it's it's a common currency or a common language that we're now using between the, our associates who have skills identified on their profile and the jobs that require the skills. And that kind of matching uh, becomes a lot easier when you have this common language around skills. And so, Dave, you know, we've we, you just heard, uh, you know, a, a little about how a company's already started moving this way. But, you know, sometimes those degrees have been the a barrier, uh, you know, even though they may be what you need, they, they and sometimes have become a barrier. And you're such an example yourself uh, coming from a tech background, um, you know, and, and social entrepreneur at this point, creating this uh, organization called Amped uh, that uses music and technology as a catalyst for uh, empowering youth and families. Um, and you've recently gotten funds to specifically target, help communities of color get over fear to get to sort of normalize tech and data and, and these types of things. Tell us a little bit more about uh, your story and how are, um, you know, how are you able to help your graduates, you know, get access to and get sort of an on-ramp to these good jobs? Yeah, th uh, thank you, Mary Gwynn and, and Roger, thank you, Telly. Um, so, so a little bit about my background and, and how this makes so much sense to me is, and I tell this story all the time, I didn't have a college degree until I was 40 years old and I was working in technology way before that. I was self-taught. Um, then from that point took some certifications and classes and things like that and actually owned a tech comp company actually before I even had a degree. And so understanding that, that first of all, a couple things in underserved communities, the, the one of the quickest ways out of poverty is to have a job that pays a living wage or above. And we all know that these technology jobs and careers in technology do that. And they have an upward trajectory to take you from beyond, you know, even where you start in, say, middle class or whatever. And so you can really plan and do some things. I um, mean, you can change whole communities that way. And so that was sort of my 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 entry, if you will, into it when we started the amp, uh, music program and we started working with kids and then realizing that those kids were going into homes where parents were struggling. And these were parents that didn't have high school diplomas in some cases, their GEDs didn't have um, 
uh, college degrees, some didn't have college degrees, may have had a two year associates, et cetera. But all the jobs that we were we were you know trying to get them into required those things. And and I'll just use the quote that I always use. My father told me when I was 12 years old, he said, if no one would hire you, hire yourself. And so what we understood was that, OK, if we can get these folks the training and then get them into jobs and technology, then we were fine. But then we ran into that better that er, that educational barrier where people needed you know, four years college degree. And, and I have to just quickly say that the Humana was a champion in helping us to get beyond that hurdle, because what we initially did to, to, to deal with that was we started our own tech company. So we started a company called AmpTech. Which, so then we could hire, we could train those folks in technology, underserved communities and black and brown folks in technology, and then immediately hire them at, at close, as close to a living wage as we could possibly afford. And again, it came with corporations and partnerships and things to help Metro United Way and uh, Brown Forum and help us pay for those things. But that was kind of how we broke down those barriers. And that's how we led to where we are now, because what I know is, and, and I tell people this all the time, as a black person, uh, a black man in technology for 20 plus years, I, that doesn't make me a genius. That makes me very blessed, and but, it, but I am a unicorn. And we don't, you don't see a lot of the number 7.6% of blacks in technology is not because there's there, that you have to be a genius to do it, it's because we haven't been exposed. And you mentioned, you actually said this earlier about taking away the fear uh, of technology in the black community. We literally had a, we had a lady that was literally afraid to touch the keyboard because she was afraid, because, because all the sort of uh, mystique around technology and how you have to be this, you know, math, math wizard, or, you know, engineering, science. Look, my father was a, had a third grade, uh, third grade education and was one of the very first entrepreneurs I knew. And so the fact that he didn't go beyond the third grade didn't mean that he couldn't learn. That means that the situation, the circumstance that he faced put him in a situation where he couldn't go beyond third grade because he had to help families. And, and I'm, we work in those communities. We work with communities where, and it always frustrates me when you hear people say, well, they just don't want a job. There's jobs all over the place. They just need to apply themselves. That's garbage because there's there's gotta be this path. And we talk, that's what we're talking about now. There has to be this pathway that makes sense for the people that you're working with. The pathway that you that you have makes sense for, for the people that you're working with. It doesn't work for us. And Roger can attest to this and other organizations can attest to this. When we when we created those pathways, when we created those opportunities for training, and then folks like Roger and Humana opened up those doors for us to have, the, because it's, it's, it's one thing to say, I can train you in technology and give you the skills, but then if nobody will hire you, what's the point, right? And so until we open up those, and, and, and the floodgates kind of open, and, and Roger will tell you that we're, we're gaining momentum. The, the thing that I said in the Microsoft press conference about two years ago was that the, the organizations and the institutions and corporations had the responsibility of providing the resources, I mean, the opportunity. I, we had to convince our people, the black and brown folks that we serve, that they can do it. And that's been, and I, I'm not going to lie to you, that's been a challenge. Because for, for decades, you've been told that that's not what you do that this is not for you. And then when you talk about like trying to get the education for those that sought, sought out the education, and this is where Telly comes in, me and Telly have been having conversations around how do we merge what JCTC does with what we do so that we can make that pathway even smoother. And I think we're, you know, I, and I said to you guys before the audience came in, you know, we're, we, this is not a conversation about how to how to uh, get the wheels rolling. We're, the wheels are already rolling. We're just trying to figure out, how, we're trying to bring more people in so that we can pick up speed. Right. So I don't know. If hopefully that answers your question. Was, you know. Yeah. So just before before turning to telly, so just give us just give us the overview of what you're actually doing, uh, Dave. So you're given the Google uh, platform and then, you know, how do they get to Humana? How, you, you know, get an example, maybe walk one person through what what happens when they, they come in contact with AMP. Love it. So thank you. Yeah. So so here's here's the pathway. You come into tech, you come into AMP with no technology skills or very basic technology skills. So we do we do applied digital skills and we do some te basic technology training. We then take you and we so you go from student to learning basic technology skills to a an employee of AMP in our AMP Tech Center where you're paid $15 an hour plus free medical. Because here's the thing we got to remember when we talk about this. 
is that sometimes people aren't doing this because they can't afford to. And by that, I mean, they got to worry about putting food on the table and keeping a roof over their head and taking care of their family. So we have to deal with that initially. And, and we've had some we've been blessed to be able to do that. We hired them as on the AMP tech team, and now they're doing IT tech support. And right now we have a partnership with a uh, uh, contract with JCPS. We're doing tech, and we realize, and and, and, and uh, Humana uh, Roger can speak to this, is that we have the, these folks have the skills once we give it to them. So they go IT tech support, and then they go from that to a student again, and they still stay on our payroll. And while they're going through the general, they're getting ready for the general assembly training, we're paying them while they train. So they go from a student to an employee, to a paid student, 40 hours a week, $15 an hour, plus free medical, while they prepare for this GA uh, uh, assessment, they take the GA assessment, they get into the General Assembly program, and then on the other side, this is the beauty of it all, is on the other side of it, there's a job, a, a job promised by Humana, Brown Foreman, Kindred, Young Brands, there's jobs. And all we have to do is get them there. And again, the beauty of this, uh, Mary Gwen, is that we just keep cycling people through. And, and from the very day that they walk through the door, they're taken care of until they can then take care of themselves, because that's the goal of the program. And that's what this is all about, is making pe people independent of us. But because the, the, the whole thing about, you know, teach a man to fish, I mean, give a man a fish, you feed him for a day, teach a man to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. The missing part of that is the man has no fishing pole. Mm -hmm. And so we, we got we to gotta provide a fishing pole, and that's what we do. So. I love it. I love it, Dave. Telly, you've been, uh, you know, trying to figure out how to integrate these degrees and credentials and working with employers and identifying what employers need, uh, making things stackable. You know, tell us a little bit about uh, the, how uh, community college technical schools fit into all of this. Absolutely. And Mary Gwen, Roger, Dave, everyone on the call, thank you for the opportunity today. What an exciting conversation, right? There, all this is evolving and moving so fast. It's very exciting. Um, the one thing I think what Roger said is dead on with skills. And the thing that higher education is doing, and we're doing at Jefferson, is that we need to, it's skill validation. And it doesn't matter where you get the skills, it's how we all fit together and moving to what Dave said, right, to the goal. So one thing at Jefferson we're really doing is, is looking at, and they're popping up so fast. I mean, companies are looking at skills, looking at vendors, for profit, non-for-profit, who can help them address the skills gaps that they have and move into these positions. And what JCTC is trying to do is we know where we fit right in that middle. So we're really engaging those companies and saying, tell us what you're doing now. How can I validate that credit and apply that almost credit for prior learning to move them to that degree, that diploma, that certificate at the higher education community college level, should they want to do that? So what we're seeing is, is all these things popping up from badges, everything you said, Microsoft badging, what IBM is doing, what Google is doing. I'm using my faculty to stop and say, let's look at what they're doing and where do we fit in that funnel? What are we doing to award credit for that? And should they choose to, and the employer chooses to, pathway them up to that next level to hit the skills to exactly what Roger was talking about. And it's moving so fast. And it's really funny because it kind of freaks me out as being the, you know, the dean here or VP of Tech Head that everything I'm teaching my students may not be needed in 10 years, <laughs> right? So, so when we're talking about skills and we're talking about technical skills, what we're looking at as colleges, it's not just the technical stuff, it's the critical thinking skills. It's all those other things. On a national scale, a lot of colleges are moving to what's called co-curricular transcripts. So they're looking at not just validating that you passed an A-plus class or you passed a Cisco stack, but they are also, how did you demonstrate that you can critically think? How did you demonstrate decision-making? How did you demonstrate that you are a good citizen or civic, right? So there's all these competencies. So this credentialing conversation is moving so fast and what I'm trying to do, what we're trying to do at Jefferson is show up and do all our listening and listening to Roger, listening to our providers here in town and see where we fit and offer those solutions that do exactly what you just said, create real opportunity for everyone who's involved. Absolutely. So Telly, there was a question in the Q&A that maybe you can just tag on to what you were sure. saying, which was, you know, how do people, how do candidates figure out what badges are actually useful? Uh, and what certifications? How do you find people and help them get on the the on ramp, so to speak? How do, yeah, how do you and, and, yes, and I do that. One is 
all of my programs at Jefferson are validated by employers. So if I see things that I don't know what those are, I'm going to employers and say, what is this? Do you know about this and what's going on? Then all of our faculty are doing continuing education and training to validate what that is, because it's not just that there that there's a training that's supposed to teach a skill. How am I validating that that skill is doing what it's supposed to do? Because if we don't do that, how is that going to provide any outcome if I don't have completers that can do the work? So I'm doing that mostly through employers, but I'm also validating that through my faculty to say, are you seeing this? And I could have, and I, I see this happening as employers are being more and more engaged, which is wonderful at the high school level all the way up to my level and into the four-year level and to the master's degree level, the graduate school. So what we're trying to do is be that middle point as a community college and look at it almost like a little ecosystem, as Dave said, the pathway, where do we fit and how are we awarding credit for the programs that really do what they're supposed to do? And a lot of this is speed. Why, why wouldn't I give credit for something that's strong and issues a credential that's valued by the employer and get someone a better job? That's what I'm supposed to be doing too. And there's so much need, we all should be playing together. So that's where we are and uh, and that's what we're doing. Yeah, and if I could just tag on to, to Tilly's comment, I think he's right on. Because as employers, it's upon us to be able to define what those skills are we need in the future. Because Tilly could go ask us and we'd say, well, we're not really sure. Uh, you know, three years, five years from now, uh, we're gonna need some of these skills. We'll always need uh, these, these capabilities to run our business and so forth. But but it's upon us, and that is, uh, what's the strategy of the business? Where are we going? Where's the customer going? Where? What are the kinds of needs that we're going to need to to meet in the future, and then translate that into capabilities and skills? And you know, the easy one in in these times is are around digital and analytic skills. Uh, but there are more. But those are the kinds of things that our customer is constantly evolving around: how they access their health information, how they they use it, how, how it helps them with quality of life and their health. And so it's upon us to make sure that we have digital analytic capabilities and skills that are going to be needed uh, as far as we can see. And so then when Telly calls and, and we say, well, here's, here are the five areas that we're, we know we're going to need great talent with skills. And to, to Telly's point, how do you demonstrate that? And the credential is just merely a, a you know, manifestation or an artifact of that, of those uh, demonstrations. And and then how do you place the value in the credentials? And that's I think that's an ongoing conversation that we're doing. Roger, you've inspired a lot of comments in the uh, in the chat about how other employers might do this. That, that Humana may be ahead of the game uh, a little bit in this. And you know, what what advice would you have, or, or how do you think we can get more employers to think about this uh, on ramping and building skills ramps and within and uh, you know as a bench? Well, I'll, I'll give you the bad news first, and I'll give you the good news. <laughs> the bad news is it takes time. And it's not something that can be done right away because it takes a lot of very detailed uh, analytic work on your jobs. And and so it does take some time. It's not something that's going to happen overnight. And so I, I'll say that. And now the good news. <laughs> the good news is that uh, there are skills inventories and other things that we used and we leveraged to accelerate the work. So it is not new stuff. And you don't need to create it on your own. There are, the, and, and if there are others in the chat that want to take this offline, I will be more than happy to uh, to help, but but there are various skills inventories, Mary Gwen, with definitions and and things like that that will get you started. And, and certainly the, the the colleges and universities can help with that as well in terms of how they're thinking about those skills and competencies and defining those. And so there's just a lot of foundational work. It's how it gets applied within a specific company that's sort of the heavy lifting part of that. And Mary Green, if I can jump in just really quickly and talk about, um, we talk about the cost of doing this program and, and efficiency and accuracy. The, the, what Telly was talking about, identifying those things up front, because a lot of times, you know, we, we'll, we'll be spinning our wheels trying to do all this training and we just, just train on whatever, um, and then find to only to find out that's not something that's necessary. Well, to get the best bang for our buck and the best return on our investment, when we put those dollars in because this work is so important, having Telly to identify what, what he should be teaching and then having us knowing what we should be teaching and Roger telling us those organizations and corporations telling us what those skills are, then we can cut right to the chase. And we can know that when we're training folks, that we're training them for a position that exists right now. 
right? And not just because the, 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 I mean, as being a t technology for 20 plus years myself, it was always this idea that just get as many as you can. Like they, there was really no real serious pathway or understanding of like what that even meant. Because people even, like if you go online now and you search for the top 10 things you should have, it'll give you 10 things. But that, that doesn't mean that those job, that there are jobs out there for those things. Um, and so we need to get away from that and, and, and sort of streamline the whole process with just like what, Tell, what Telly's doing, what Roger's doing, to find out what we should be training so that we can get more people trained and ready for jobs that exist right now. You know, and Dave, you mentioned something too that sort of uh, t tips another theme that we we haven't really uh, gotten into, which is, you know, uh, affordability and access, you know, just because, you know, higher ed has gotten quite expensive and uh, we're looking at ways to cut those costs. But, um, you know, t t talk to us a little bit about, I mean, you've, you've figured out one way, uh, which is actually to make it a job. Um, you know, uh, I'd like to hear a little bit more from you about how your thoughts on how we make this more affordable and then, um, you know, Telly and Roger jump in as well. Telly, I know that you've also, you know, done ways to, by giving credit, uh, you, you figured out how to draw down some of the financial aid scholarships, like our work ready scholarship, but we can come back. So Dave, start us off on that. Yeah, and, I, and I'll just throw that, because Telly and I just recently had a conversation about how do we take what we're, what we're teaching um, and merge and sort of blend it with what he's teaching so that then we, the, the people that go from us to, 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 to ACTC can then get credit and, that, and lower costs for them. The other piece of that is is that you know with, with folks like Roger. So the, when we when we create a more and it's and it's proven that the, the, this is not just Dave saying this, but a more diverse workforce is a more profitable workforce. And and we know that there's lots of lots of work, a ton of work that needs to be done in terms of a d diversity in in the especially in technology in the workforce, right? So as far as the costs go, when companies like Roger, like Humana. Is are willing to invest in that training, and 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 provide that opportunity for the folks that we serve. That's kind of how we deal with it. We look at like, okay, it's a it's an even thing. Like, so we we have skills, you need skills, and so when we can bring all these folks together, that that can be done. And then when you when you when you take an organization like ours, a nonprofit organization like, like ours, we can reduce the cost of that training because we're doing the training ourselves versus. And, and I and I hate to say this because I don't want to throw anybody on the bus in the sense that that there's all these these folks out here doing this train different training that are really just taking advantage of the opportunity to make the money on the need. And what we're doing as a nonprofit organization is saying that we just need our folks to get jobs and we're going to do whatever we can because for us, when, even when we talk about like somebody, some company hiring our people to do the work, we just need enough to pay them. So we're not in this to like, you know, have a bigger building or a bigger, you know, bigger, nicer stuff, right? We want to make sure that people get taken care of. So at this level, the cost for us is just what we need to get the job done. Well, do you gonna, it looks like you well, want to say. Well, one thing I'll add on that too, as specifically at JCTC, you know, mo most people don't know if you know that two thirds of our students receive a Pell Grant. Okay, they're getting assistance from a Pell Grant federal government to come to school. About 70 to 80 percent of our students are working already. OK, so, you know, this is something that's taking place already. What we're trying to do is listen to all these big systems that are up here that are changing. Evolve 502, for example, is happening here in Jefferson County. More high school students know they can come to JCTC and if they don't qualify for a Pell Grant, get last dollar cost to go into all of our programs, from IT, manufacturing, all these programs. But we also have to understand, too, and their state, like you said, the Kentucky Work Ready Scholarship, which is great. But we also have to look at when it comes to completion, moving into programs. This is why apprenticeships are so hot right now. Because in an apprenticeship, not only are you getting training, but you're getting paid to be on the job and you're learning skills on the job and earning credit for it. That's why this is working. So when you're looking at people who are under-resourced, you're looking at people who are struggling. I mean, they may not speak badge, but they speak job. <laughs> they may not speak badging, but they speak community college. So how do I take what we all know and understand this at this level and create pathways? And Roger's exactly right. What we're doing is that we have a BIT 502 program that started, an apprenticeship program. What that's doing is, is taking taking students, participants, and adults and putting them to work and doing exactly what the employers want us to do and doing it for no, no cost to the student. The student's not paying any tuition for that because of all 502, they can take you work ready scholarships. And we have um, people who are giving the college money to cover last dollar because they know this is so important. And, and I, let me quickly yeah, add to that, that would, is that, I'm oh, sorry, go ahead, go ahead Roger. Dave. 
Well, I was going to say, just oh, you look at the overall picture. I'm looking at the return on investment, right? Like, because I understand that the nonprofit, like people, like our goodwill is our, is what we what we serve, right? It was what what our product is, if you will. But I also understand business. I understand that the companies and and communities and government have to understand how this benefits them. If we take people that are that are on uh, assistance now, right? That are that are struggling, working two or three jobs, trying to trying to take care of their kids, and we put them into jobs that make a living wage and jobs that likely will be a day shift where they can spend more time, they give them the opportunity to spend more time with their kids. Look at all that we do. We take people from, from assistance to, a, to, to part of the community on a tax base, supporting businesses, all those things. Not only that, but, but what's most important to me is those same families, those same parents are now in the house. And get this, having kids that have a parent, that like a, a, a black kid having a parent that walks through the door that works in technology and they can now see a different future. I mean, this is a huge, this is more than just about getting a job. It's about it's about all the self-efficacy that's created, all the confidence that's created, the trajectory that, the, like when my daughter walks into the house, she sees an entrepreneur and a pharmacist, right? That look like her, you, you see what I mean? And so that, so it's more than just the dollars. And when we talk about the cost of it, it's a temporary cost. It's a it's a short thing. Like in a year, we're doing this right with the, with the program that we're doing with. So we're taking somebody in a year and putting them in a job that pays a living wage in a year, less than a year actually. It's less than a year because it's, it's, it's an intensive. So when we talk about the cost of it, it's not as expensive as you think, because the the the, the it's, it's far more expensive to leave it like it is and let people suffer. Yeah, I just add on to that. I agree with everything, and just to you know to to earn and then have the opportunity to learn, and so to have have this living wage that Dave's describing, and have just the opportunity to learn. I mean, certain uh, individuals are in certain times of their life where they may be working three time, three part time jobs just to make ends meet, and and then we say, well, if you just get this credential or this certificate, then you could change that trajectory, and and I have no time. Uh, you know, um, I've got three jobs and I'm trying to, so, so hoping that bridge that Dave talks about. And then when you start to get that living wage job, now you're earning with an opportunity to learn more and, and, and because now you have a little bit more time. And so I always think, think about it from an opportunity standpoint, access, Mary, going to your point, but, but, uh, but this earning and then the opportunity to learn, and then that starts to create optionality for you. And, and optionality is uh, as I'm building skills and credentials, I'm thinking about I now have different options than I had before. Um, because the the opposite of that is when individuals and people feel stuck in their current job, they feel stuck in their current uh, situation because they don't feel like they have options because of the uh, just the lack of visibility or the lack of opportunity that they've had to do that. And that's what we're trying to create is is that opportunity to learn that creates optionality and then you start earning with, a, with even more opportunity to learn beyond that and it just becomes starts a virtuous cycle but you've got to get that start that dave's talking about and you've got to be able to, to have that sort of pause to, to take the time to earn a credential and so forth and so that's what we're trying to do is build those bridges uh, for for individuals and and now i think our, our biggest challenge now is how do we scale that even further and how do we reach more individuals uh, and people to get that opportunity because the question is not whether they want to it's it's right. the question is can i right like it's like can, can I, I i tell people like people when we first started our program in 2015 doing technology training people were like why are you paying people to come to class and that's the most ridiculous question because think about this and, and i'll just use a, a bible analogy god jesus fed the masses before he before he spoke because a hungry, a hungry, the growling stomach, you can't hear over a growling stomach. And so if, if, if I'm gonna sit you in a room and tell you to learn something that might benefit you in the, in the future, it's difficult when you're sitting there trying to figure out how am I gonna get my kids fed? How am I gonna take care, like, like all those things. And so to, to Roger's point is that that bridge is providing resources at the very beginning, immediately, as quickly as you can, Providing a place and not a handout. It's absolutely not a handout. It's 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 what they it's what people need. If they had the same resources and opportunities as other folks had, then no, we wouldn't need to do that. But that's not the case, and we all know that's not the case. And we have to we have to accept that that's what it is, and be willing to put in uh, to do what we need to do to make sure that people can comfortably 
right? And that's not a, that's not a bad thing to say. You should be able to do it comfortably to, to, to that path where you can then take care of yourself. You know, Dave, I think it's so important. Um, I was a, a, at a conference last week, uh, another uh, virtual s summit, uh, where a speaker uh, spoke about uh, the bandwidth for cognitive resources. So if you think about your brain having a certain amount of bandwidth, your brain's taking care of a lot of different things at, at the same time. It's worrying about your, your digestion. It's worrying about, you know, the environment. It's and when all when your cognitive resources are you know consumed by that, by other kinds of stresses, by microaggressions, by you know lots of different ways that you can divert those, it really affects learning. So you know I, I really appreciate your your um, uh, comment there about you need to take care of some of those. Uh, and and I know the community colleges are doing that. Higher ed is doing that. Um, schools are doing that. That's a lot of what Evolve 52 is 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 uh, uh, trying to address. But I think we're also talking about, um, you know, in this this summit, data and uh, data uh, and data automation and AI. These are these are things that people don't even know. An, an earlier speaker said, you know, data science wasn't a science ten years ago. This is so new. So I guess I'm. Uh, let me just throw it out to all everybody. How do you how do you help people? get some familiarity with what these opportunities are. I've heard a little bit about, you know, create these pathways so people can see where it goes. Um, you know, Telly, maybe maybe some other examples of how with specific jobs or apprenticeships, you know, how do you help people understand what these certifications are? Well, I think you have to talk in real world terms. That's the first thing I think we love. I mean, the words we use are just fascinating to me. <laughs> we love our words and um, and, and when, we're, when I'm talking to students about manufacturing machining, I'm not talking about a 5X machine. I'm saying, did you brush your teeth this morning? <laughs> Someone made that. <laughs> this machine made something like that. So I think you kind of have to rethink how we're, how we're really advocating and cheerleading what we're trying to say and what we're trying to do. And the other thing, and, I just, and I'm kind of going back here to what Dave said, that I think it's important that we all talk about this. Offering curriculum is easy, okay? Offering training is easy. But if people don't trust you, it doesn't matter. And if you don't do it in from your heart of building community where we lift everyone and we all win, it doesn't matter. So the series of students fail at Jefferson is not because they're failing their yoga class or their A plus class or English class. It's everything else that's going on in their life. That's why they struggle. So when we're talking about having, like you just said, Mary, going about talking about AI, why would you listen to me? <laughs> Why would you listen to me? Why would you let, why would you take a risk with me for you to challenge what you know and to get your head, as you said, that cognitive bandwidth to think totally differently of what could be, and I'm using words you may not even understand, right? So, so when we're having these conversations and talking about badging and skill up, we also have to assume and, and, and they recognize that this is a community conversation. This is a conversation about respecting people where they are them then trusting you that you have the ability to move together to where you both want to go and and that you both win and that you both win um mary good to be quite honest i have trouble keeping up with the terms <laughs> there's been many times yeah. i've walked out of meetings and i'm googling something or i'm calling dr jelston jefferson what does this mean <laughs> so um i think we all have to stay cutting edge on top of it but at the same time we can say all the words we want but if people don't people don't understand why, why you're doing it, what your real intention is, and trust you, then it's a mute conversation. It's an absolute mute conversation. Yeah, and I would just add to that. I, I agree, and I would just challenge, I, and I would just challenge when you hear those words, just challenge the thinking there, because sometimes we can grab words and, and it's very easy shorthand, and it, it, it feels like the word of the day kind of thing, where, because I'll, I'll just give you our perspective on that. Um, you know, uh, data science is, is without a doubt a skill and a very, very high level skill for us. Uh, but when you think about data scientists, uh, we don't have that many at Humana. We have uh, that have that title of a data scientist. Uh, but I'll tell you what, we have, if you look at the skills in data science type skills or data analytics or advanced analytics and so forth, we have thousands of jobs that require those skills. And so when you start to think about the skills that I'm developing, I could, you know, our actuarial science group has, those are analytic skills, those are math skills, those are actuarial skills. 
uh, when we talk about, uh, we have many, many business intelligence roles that are doing analytics on every part of our business. Uh, we have uh, clinical analytics, we consumer analytics. So there are, um, you know, when we think about, you know, using a shorthand like like a data science or data scientist and so forth, that you got to peel that back and say, what are we really talking about here? And when you start talking about skills, it just actually opens up lots of opportunities. And then to the points we made earlier, that allows access and allows easier access. If, if we need to hire a data scientist, that's not an entry level job for us. But if you want to, if we, if, if someone has analytic skills and has built those through Dave's program or through Telly's programs and so forth, we have many jobs that are analyst jobs that then get into the career path that could ultimately be in the, the data scientist type of role. But those are the kinds of things, that's the conversation we need to have. And, and I'll just make a last point on that is that oftentimes when we think about our resume, and this is just the way that, you know, the system has been for a long time that we need to break down. We think about resumes or LinkedIn profiles or whatever, even our internal profiles, it's usually job driven. What jobs did I have? And what degrees do I have? Uh, when we think about that differently to say, what skills have I developed and what could, how did I demonstrate those skills and how can I validate that I've demonstrated those skills? That's a very different conversation than kind of the more traditional ways we've been thinking about it. And I'll just throw in there, my grandfather used to say, he was a preacher, he said, put it down there where the kids can get it. And and that's, that, <laughs> you know, we, 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 impress, we, we impress ourselves with these words and I remember sitting in a meeting one time, and I tell you, I think you might have been in a meeting, so I might be telling on myself. We were sitting in a meeting one time, and we were all sitting around talking about art of AI and artificial intelligence, and we, everybody's like, AI this and AI that, and internet over everything. And I stopped, and I said, hey, somebody help me out, because, you know, I don't want to be left out. Can somebody tell me what AI means? Like, I knew what it stood for. Like, can anybody tell, explain artificial intelligence to me? And the room went silent. Do you remember that meeting, Telly? The room, the, room, the room went silent because everybody had an idea of what it was. And somebody even said that, well, I don't really, I don't know if I can explain it, but I really, I kind of understand it. Well, never if you can't explain it. But that's what we did, even in a room of people, professionals, like we're all tech folks and we're trying to figure out how to explain this. And and I think, uh, I can remember Ben Rito Weber and some folks that, that was doing, a, uh, uh, Alan Baruby uh, from the Brookings Institute, did a presentation on artificial intelligence in and over everything, and that was the first time I had a clear picture in my mind of what all that was. I mean, I kind of knew, sort of, and I've been in technology for 20 plus years, so imagine somebody that just, you know, they can't even do a Word document yet. Mm -hmm. Well, Dave, I just got to say, man, I I'm going to have to go back and watch this so that you got the perfect Dr. Phil quotes, man. You feel like you need to have your own talk show. You're telling <laughs> <it> today. <laughs> That's You're summarizing it well today. <laughs> That's what grandfather said. Put it down where the kids can get it. Right. Well, yeah. and people are responding in the chat, but if anybody has uh, questions they want, please put them in the chat or raise your hand and we'll figure out how to get you. Well, one, thing I wanna, one thing I want to answer, one of the questions that came up is colleges for a long time have done, you know, prior learning assessments and the fancy words like portfolio assessment or test outs. And one thing I've seen change the last six years is doing more of that. So if someone has been a plumber for 20 years, why am I going to make you take my plumbing curriculum? So our faculty will bring you into a lab and do like skills checkoffs, right? So same thing. If, if you have IT experience coming to talk to us and it's hard work and we're like Roger, we're building that now. But why would I make you repeat something that doesn't do anybody any good? So so we're evolving in that, too, when it comes to looking at that credit for prior learning. How can I validate skills to my accreditation to my employer advisory board to the employer where they're working and validate those skills to move them to where they need to go to get to that data science job that exactly Roger's talking about. Yeah I mean in the end you know it, that's what degrees were supposed to be about anyway and you know was to, to validate skills and competencies or knowledge and I think we're, we're understanding that knowledge sets are less important than the skills to be able to access them and to you know everything available to us uh, on the internet. It's more about um, using and analyzing and uh, that critical thinking. So um, I love that uh, that that it's really about validating. Uh, but the people, it's it's a mind shift. It's a paradigm shift we all have to make to be shifting towards. And it's hard for higher ed to be thinking competency based versus uh, you know. Uh, credentialing and step steps, uh, you know, inputs, <laughs> you know, rather than outputs. But what's uh, let's see, 
Are you doing a evaluation as uh, Telly with some of asked? Um, Whoever Ronald is, I am fighting that fight. Absolutely. On the general education side. Absolutely. I'm fighting that fight. We have wonderful faculty too, but this is a new way of thinking for them as well. Absolutely. And we're going to have to evolve. And if COVID has been awful, it's been tough, but it's definitely caused colleges around the country to rethink what we're doing and being delivery and being, being competitive. As I said to a coworker recently, I don't want to be the next blockbuster. We will change and we will evolve. I mean, we're going to have to. And uh, there is a good definition of AI in there for you, uh, Dave, in the chat. Uh, but uh, <laughs> let me go check it out real quick. Uh, and and Roger, you know, just the, speaking of data, just describe a little bit about how you used uh, data analytics to analyze what your own uh, employees had, and you know, to help you sort of down this path. Uh, I think that's a pretty interesting story. Yeah. So. Um, uh, when, one of the things that we've done is is we're we're looking at these not only the skills match the jobs but uh, but we have you know many of our uh, we call them associates but our employees are it's all referred to associates but uh, many of our associates have have uh, added their skills to their profiles and so just thinking about um, doing the data analytics on the skills of our workforce. Uh, has been very enlightening for us to, to think about what, what we need in the future and where the gaps are and, and those kinds of things. So so it, it really helps once we, we have the, the data into our systems to do the analytics on top of that. And then as we um, to shift gears a little bit, Mary Gwen, as, as we thought about, uh, back to my earlier point, when we started thinking about analytics skills as part of that work, we said, uh, you know, we need as, as, as much external resources and internal from uh, skill development, upskilling, reskilling, and analytics as we can get. Because when we started seeing how pervasive analytic skills are when you look horizontally across our jobs as opposed to vertically in our jobs, uh, it was pretty compelling for us that um, not only did we have the need today in the jobs that we have, but where healthcare is going in the future, particularly integrated health and the kinds of things that we're doing requires and is going to require much deeper analytic skills at all levels in many, many different areas. And so that's that's an easy bet for us uh, to invest um, because skill development, just like education and so forth, it does take time. I mentioned the more rapid cycle in certain skills, but it takes time. You can't flip the switch and expect that to be done. So investing now for the future is is, is clearly an investment that, that we're willing to make. And, 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 and that's upskilling. And, and just so we're clear on definitions, I know we talk a little bit about definitions of terms, but, but I, when I think about upskilling, I'm thinking about skilling in job and enroll, and you're taking someone's basic skill level and you're raising that. Reskilling is when someone kind of changes a career trajectory um, and they go from one domain area to another. And I'm reskilled to now take on a different career path that I may not have thought it was even open to me in the past but I have some foundational or transferable skills and now I've built on that. And now I've actually created more options for myself or I've changed my whole career trajectory based on an opportunity that I didn't think I would have. And it's, and it, and it, you know, it, it's a different way to have that conversation than, you know, just go get your degree or not. And that's important. And we're going to continue to do that because we want uh, people to get their degrees and, and get their credentials and so forth. But, we can also say with this skill set, you can change your career trajectory within, within the company. Yeah, I'd just like to call people's attention to the chat too, where um, you know, a number of the people who uh, did that uh, reskilling program are on the call today. So shout out to to all of them, uh, April, Karen, Janet, uh, Stacy. Um, so this is this is this is great, and I think you know I, I just want to close and then let you all have any final comments you have too. I think the challenge we're hearing here is. Um, you know, one of uh, getting out of our paradigms a little bit and thinking about, um, you know, skills. Uh, somebody mentioned degrees also come with a social, uh, you know, you know, level within it. It gives you standing in our society, you know. But 
we're in it. We've got to be rethinking all of this higher ed. Um, and so one way to do that is what I'm hearing is integrating. You know, you got your current job while you're doing your current job. Take a badge, get, you know, get a certification, sort of start to explore when you're in, um, you know, community college. You might be uh, thinking about how to stack some of these things that they can actually lead to a degree that would help you to get on to bachelor's. You know, when you're uh, in, in JCPS right now, they're saying all public school, high school kids should graduate with some kind of certification, you know, or credential. Um, you know, people who are thinking about getting back in and already have some things, there's lots of ways to get that prior credit. Uh, there's a thing called, um, what is it, CLEP? Uh, Telly, uh, you know, you, you can take tests that yeah, old school clap. Yes. Old yeah. School. I mean, you know, these are, yeah, it's old school, but it's, it's the kind of ways to, to help us think about those, um, you know, that we, we got to think about ourselves too, as, as, uh, lifelong learners, uh, which, you know, our, our mayor has, uh, uh, often challenged us to, to, to make this a community that understands that lifelong learning is, is, is how we're going to all thrive. Last comments. Got a few minutes. Well, tell you here just one thing, uh, Jefferson particularly, there's a lot of resources available out there that's coming from the state, that's coming from the feds, a lot of money coming down for federal apprenticeships and things like this. So so the challenge for our board chair, Jim Lancaster, Lynn Fisher, uh, you know, Christy Ralston, uh, Dr. Handy, all these folks, they're challenging us to be really engaging employers and to try to develop systems that work for them. And what is Jefferson doing that's going to work for them? So uh, Jefferson's here to do that. And the thing I want people to understand, too, is that if Jefferson gets enrollment, that doesn't matter if they don't transfer to U of L or get a job. <laughs> it's an ecosystem, right? It's all of us together. So there's meetings I'm in and I refer people to Code Louisville. There's meetings I'm in, I'm referring people to the Urban League. So we have to look at this as an ecosystem. Uh, but if I can be involved in any conversation with anybody here to help with that and get you connected, if not with me, anyone, uh, please reach out to me and let me know. And I'll put my email in the chat, but I know you'll probably have it in the information as well. And Mary Gwen, before we go, I just want to issue a challenge to the, the corporations, foundations, organizations that can that can help. Um, two things. One is to be a part of this training program and, and to support um, the training for folks keep coming into your company or even to coming into other companies. Uh, that's that's the one thing. The second thing is to to challenge your your um, your implicit bias. Ask yourself why didn't I hire that person? If that person was qualified, think about what it was that really um, dig deep and, and understand. That that maybe the opportunity was is, is is the right one. Give that person a chance and not not let that that sort of feeling that you have that's not even really valid um, make 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 you not give that person an opportunity. I just make one quick comment as we're at time, and that is, um, you know, our, our community is a special place, and that we have started to build some really really good foundational elements of the ecosystem that Tilly mentioned and what Dave's been talking about. And and for our community to be a role model city uh, and community for the kinds of things we're talking about, that ecosystem has to work. And it, when it doesn't work, we have a lot of people with well-intentioned doing great things. It's just not connected. And so it's hard for, for individuals to access and know how to, how to get access and move their way through it. When the ecosystem's working, it, it really can create the momentum that I think we've started here and that we just need to continue to do. And that's employers, that's uh, third parties, that's universities, colleges, it's all of that that has to work together in lockstep. So I would just challenge us to continue to build the ecosystem and work together. Yeah, and I'd say that takes partners uh, and partnerships, and I've heard each of you talk uh, about that today. So I, I, I um, uh, encourage everybody to leave this with uh, inspired as I am uh, about the opportunities that are out there to create these pathways and, uh, and on ramps. Um, and to uh, uh, go at it with an abundance mentality. There's so much opportunity and so much uh, that we can gain by working together. So. All right, I think we are at time. Thank you, Roger, Dave. Yes, thank you. It's been great. Bye bye. Yeah. Okay. I think we've got it all.